Welcome everybody to our fifth day of basic logic. Today we're going to shift our focus away from deductive logic and move into inductive logic. We're only going to spend one day on inductive logic. We're only going to spend one day on it because most of the arguments that we're going to confront in this class are deductive in nature. Now, in order to understand the basic concepts of inductive logic, which obviously is what I want to do first and foremost today, and as I say on my uh, little outline up here, I think it's helpful to do so in parallel with the basic concepts of deductive logic. Understanding the basic concepts of inductive logic in parallel with the basic concepts of deductive logic will make our understanding of the basic concepts of inductive logic easier and it'll also give us a chance to review for the test the basic concepts of deductive logic so i don't have to do that basic work in our next session which is devoted to review in our review session the next session i can spend more time focusing on higher order problems Okay, so let's start with the most basic review of logic. What's the, what's the, uh, the key concept of logic that we have to define first and foremost? Logic itself. What is logic itself? Logic is the study of the techniques for assessing arguments. Now, logic is divided into two separate domains. Deductive logic on the one hand and inductive logic on the other hand. Since logic itself is the study of the techniques for assessing arguments in general, what is deductive logic? This is review. You should be able to know like that by now. Deductive logic is the study of the techniques particularly for assessing deductive arguments. In parallel, what do you think the definition of inductive logic is? This is also a review because I did define it for you formally a few days prior to this um, and also it's down here actually but if this think about it though if logic is the study of the techniques for assessing arguments in general and if deductive logic is the study of the techniques for assessing deductive arguments in particular what is inductive logic inductive logic is the study of the techniques for assessing particularly inductive arguments as I just wrote on the chart. Okay, now the next question becomes, what the hell is an inductive argument? I already defined an inductive argument for you a few classes ago, but let's do so in parallel with a deductive argument. What's a deductive argument? A deductive argument is an argument, this is also review of course, where the premises are intended to do what to the conclusion? It's an argument where the premises are intended to guarantee, that's the key word there, guarantee the conclusion. A deductive argument is, in other words, an argument intended to be such that, intended to be such that, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. What then is, in parallel, an inductive argument? An inductive argument is an argument intended to be such that if the premises are true, the conclusion is probably true. In other words, an inductive argument, and as I say down here, is an argument where the premises are intended not to guarantee the conclusion, but instead to make the conclusion more likely to be true than not true. Okay, what's our goal when we make an inductive argument? Well, I can specify our goal when we make an inductive argument in parallel of specifying our, our goal when we make a deductive argument. You all know what the goal is of someone who makes a deductive argument. The goal of someone who makes a deductive argument is to make a successful deductive argument, obviously. Now, we have a name for a successful deductive argument. What is a successful deductive argument called? A successful deductive argument is called a sound argument. A sound argument um, is a successful deductive argument. What is the goal of someone? That's review. You all know that. Here's where we get into new material today. What is the goal of someone who makes an inductive argument? 
the goal of someone who makes an inductive argument is to make a cogent argument. That's a new vocabulary term. The term cogent parallel in, in, in inductive land parallels the term sound in deductive land. So what is a cogent argument? Well, let's, just like I've been doing, let's define a cogent argument in parallel to uh, a sound argument. A sound argument is not just simply and vaguely put a successful deductive argument. A sound argument in particular is an argument that meets two requirements. One, it must be valid. And two, it must have all true premises. You'll see likewise that a cogent argument has a similar structure. A cogent argument is not just a successful inductive argument. It's, well, well, well it is, but it more less vaguely put, a cogent argument is an argument that meets two requirements. One, it must be strong, and that's not just a, I'm not just saying that loosely, that's a technical term. It's an argument that must be strong, as I wrote there on the, on the, on the chart, and it must have all true premises. All right, at this point, um, I guess we need to define this new key term right here, strong. You never heard that term before. You ha you've heard the term before in a colloquial sense, but in the technical sense in which we mean it in, in inductive logic, you haven't heard it before, unless you've been reading. I mean, at least I never covered it for you before. So let's, so what is a strong argument? Let's define it in parallel to, what do you think we're going to define it in parallel to? To the parallel concept over here. Valid. What is a valid argument? A valid argument is an argument where it is impossible for the conclusion to be false. Remember, logically impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. In other words, to put it the other way around, a valid argument is an argument um, where if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. You can use that kind of same kind of that same structural way of wording a valid argument to word a strong argument, except when you word a strong argument, you're going to use probability speak because inductive logic is really, I guess I'll put it right here in this text box, is really prob probabilistic logic. Inductive logic, in other words, is probabilistic logic. So when you define a strong argument, you have to use that probability language there. Okay, um, so a strong argument is an argument where if the premises are true, the conclusion is probable. In other words, a strong argument is an argument where the conclusion is more likely to be true than not true if the premises are true. So you see the tight parallel we have here? A valid argument is an argument where it is logically impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. A strong argument is an argument where the conclusion is more likely to be true than not true if the premises are true. Another way of wording a strong argument and to bring out a, a new vocabulary term, um, a strong argument is not a weak argument. A strong argument is not a weak argument, another technical term. Since you know what a strong argument is, um, I'm sure you can define what a weak argument is, but let's actually define a weak argument in parallel to the corresponding concept in deductive logic. And what's that corresponding concept? I guess I'll write it right here in a text box, in this little blank space, invalid argument. <clears throat> What is an invalid argument? Do you remember what the definition of that is? An invalid argument is an argument where it is logically possible for the conclusion to be false, even if the premises are true. In other words, an invalid argument is an argument where even if the premises are true, the conclusion could still be false. Now, a weak argument, on the other hand, and in parallel, is an argument where it is not the case that the conclusion is more likely to be true than not true if the premises are true. In other words, a weak argument is an argument where um, even if the premises are true, it's not the case that the conclusion is more probable than not. 
Notice that I'm defining a strong argument and a weak argument in such a way that they cut an exhaustive dichotomy. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you're dealing with an inductive argument, it's either going to be strong or weak. There's no third option. I would have left the third option, notice, if I defined a weak argument as an argument where the conclusion is um, unlikely to be true, uh, uh, even on the assumption that the premises are true. Notice I didn't, define a weak, I didn't define a weak argument in that way. I said a weak argument is an argument where it is not the case that the conclusion is more likely to be true than not true on the assumption that the premises are true. I didn't define a weak argument as an argument where the conclusion is unlikely to be true on the assumption that the uh, premises are true. If I would have said unlikely, I would have left the third option, a case where it's equally likely to be true or not true. But an equally likely case is still going to be a weak argument on the real definition of a weak argument, which I have right here. This will all come into uh, concrete fruition for you guys momentarily, in fact, through the example that I have at the bottom of the slide. Uh, what, well, imagine if in this blank I filled in the following, 98%. Imagine if premise one, we have an argument down here. Imagine if premise one said 98% of Star Wars fans hate Jar Jar Binks, and premise two says Chris is a Star Wars fan, therefore Chris hates Jar Jar Binks. Is this argument, the one that we see at the bottom of the slide right now, is this argument strong or weak? You should be able, just based on the definitions that I just laid out, these obvious definitions that I belabored a bit, um, you should be able to see whether it's strong or weak. What's the answer? It's strong. Okay. Now, what if, however, I, let's say I change things around and I said 60% of Star Wars fans are uh, hate Jar Jar Binks. What is this argument now? Is it strong or weak? It's still strong. All right. What about this one? What else if I said 30% of Star Wars fans hate Jar Jar Binks? Would this be strong or weak? It would now be weak. What happens if I said 50%? This is kind of the point that I was getting at just a second ago. What happens if I said 50% of Star Wars fans hate Jar Jar Binks and left everything the same? In this case, given the definition of a weak argument, it still counts as weak. That's why, to go back to what I was saying, I didn't define it, uh, a weak argument as an argument where the conclusion is uh, less likely to be true than not true. Uh, well, I, I didn't, that's why, I did, to, to put it in a less convoluted way, that's why I didn't define a weak argument as an argument where the conclusion is unlikely to be true on the assumption that the premises are true. I didn't define it that way because I also want to cover the option that if the conclusion is equally likely, if the conclusion is equally likely to be true, uh, as well as not true, that still counts as a weak argument. And so I defined it in this strict way right here. It's an argument where if the premises are true, it's still not the case that the conclusion is more likely to be true than not true. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, 50% would count as weak. Let me see. What happens if I said it was 100%? What else if instead of 50, I said 100? Now, what would that be? Definitely wouldn't be weak. The question is, would it be strong or would it be valid? That's an interesting question. Now, if by 100%, I mean 100% of those sampled in a population or in a survey or something like that, then it would be just a very, very strong argument. However, if by 100%, I mean all, like deductively all, I mean 
necessarily all Star Wars fans hate Jar Jar Binks, even the ones that have yet to be born. Star Wars fans in 100 years, 100 years from now, to be bo- when they're born, they're going to grow up hating Jar Jar Binks. If I mean it in that deductive sense, then this argument would be valid. But typically, when you see 100%, that, that language of percentage, we're not talking about all in the sense of, by definition, we're talking about all or 100 percent of those b- creatures that were surveyed of whoever was surveyed in a, in a population so typically we would say this is a strong argument unless told that the 100 percent means the deductive all in which case it would be valid all right um let's see is there any other basic stuff that i have to cover i mean i have some more key terms up there but i'm going to bring them up as we go I guess one thing to bring up right now, it's important, and maybe I have this on the next slide. Hopefully I do. If not, we'll just bring it in. Okay, good. I don't want you guys to confuse, on the one hand, strength and weakness with, on the other hand, validity and invalidity. Students can easily confuse these two sets of concepts, strength and weakness on the one hand, and validity and invalidity on the other hand. It's especially easy to confuse them if they're enamored of the tight parallel that I just drew between the two sets of concepts. I drew a nice tight parallel between the concepts of deductive logic on the one hand and the concepts of inductive logic on the other hand. That parallel makes them makes the new concepts, the inductive concepts, easier to understand. However, it might, especially that approach, might invite a confusion. In particular, it might tempt you to confuse strength and weakness on the one hand with the corresponding parallel concepts of valid and invalid on the other hand, but never confuse the two. Here are two things that I want you to keep in mind so that you don't ever confuse the two. First of all, no valid arguments are strong. A valid argument is an argument in which the conclusion has to be true if the premises are true. A valid argument is an argument where if the premises are true, the conclusion is guaranteed to be true. A strong argument, on the other hand, is an argument where the conclusion is simply likely to be true if the premises are true. A strong argument, in other words, is an argument where if the premises are true, the conclusion is merely more likely to be true than not. You see that there can't be an overlap. There can never be an overlap between these two concepts. No valid argument is strong, and that implies, obviously. No strong argument is valid. You can't have a valid argument that's strong. You can't have a strong argument that's valid. These are, uh, look at it this way, deductive and inductive arguments are different kinds of arguments, right? And it's helpful to have some terms that apply to one area but not the other. Valid in particular and strong in particular are such terms. You can never have an overlap of the two. A valid argument is an argument in which the conclusion has to be true if the premises are true, and a strong argument is simply an argument where the conclusion is probably true if the premises are true. You see, you can't have an overlap. Another thing to keep in mind to, in order not to confuse strength and weakness on the one hand with validity and invalidity on the other hand is to realize, as I kind of showed you already with the Jar Jar Binks example, strength and weakness come in degrees. They admit of degrees. They're, they're, in other words, how to put this? It's a matter of more or less when it comes to strength and weakness. On the other, it's not a matter of more or less when it comes to validity and invalidity. Valid and invalid, those notions don't admit of degrees, like a thermometer, more or less, hotter or colder. Strength and weakness do. When I said, uh, what was it? Well, I'll just make it up. When it was 60%, that is weaker than when it was 98%. Um, and 100% would be stronger than it would be when it was just 98%. Strength and weakness come in degrees, but valid and invalid do not. It makes no sense to speak of an argument being more valid than another argument, for example. Um, either the argument is valid or it's not. 
either the argument, in other words, is one where the conclusion has to be true if the premises are true, in which case it's valid, or it's an argument where the conclusion doesn't have to be true, even if the premises are true, in which case it's invalid. On the other hand, and to repeat what I just said, it does make complete good sense to speak of an argument being stronger or weaker than another argument, as I showed with the uh, Jar Jar Binks example. All right. Um, so I guess another thing, and I'm glad I have this on the slide here, there is, despite the fact that I don't want you to so you have to be careful here. I drew a tight parallel between, induct between deductive concepts on the one hand and inductive concepts. At the same time, I don't want you to confuse some key uh, inductive concepts with some key deductive concepts. And yet still at the same time, and here I'm at this other asterisk right here, there is an overlap in the concepts of deductive logic and in the concepts of inductive logic, at least in one area. Notice that every inductive argument, you can probably just figure this out just by thinking about it. Every inductive argument, in other words, every strong argument and every weak argument, because an inductive argument is either strong or weak, there's no third option. Every strong argument and every weak argument, in short, every inductive argument is obviously a what kind of argument using a deductive term. Just by the definition of these terms right here, strong and weak, a strong argument is an argument where the conclusion is more likely to be true than not true on the assumption that the premises are true. And a weak argument is an argument where it's not the case that the conclusion is more likely to be true than not true on the assumption that the premises are true. So uh, based on those two definitions, how could we categorize every strong argument and every weak argument in other words, every inductive argument, using a deductive vocabulary term. What deductive vocabulary term am I going to plug in that blank? Pause it if you, you know, pause the video if you want not to just be fed the answer, but the answer is every strong argument and every weak argument is obviously an invalid argument. Or is invalid, I'll just write. Okay? An invalid argument is an argument where it's actually logically possible for the conclusion to be false on the assumption that the premises are true. It's an argument using kind of speech, using a kind of way of putting it that I've, that I've primed you for already. An invalid argument is an argument where it's possible for God to imagine the conclusion to be false, even while he imagines that the premises are true. And obviously that applies in the case of even strong arguments and in the case of weak arguments. All of them are invalid. All right, so now that I made those, those concepts clear, let's look at the following argument. Premise one, nearly all lemons that have been tasted, say by humans over the last hundred years, let's just make that put those qualifiers in there so it's to make my point clearer, Premise one, nearly all lemons that have been tasted over the last hundred years by humans were sour. Therefore, the next lemon that will be tasted by a human will be sour. Now, how do we categorize the following argument? That, that argument right there, the, uh, the sour lemon argument. Well, let's look at it. Is premise one true or false? It's true. Nearly all the lemons that have been tasted over the last hundred years by humans were sour. Um, is it strong or weak? Is the conclusion more likely to be true than not true on the assumption that this premise is true, which it actually is in real life? Yes. If the premise is true, the conclusion is probable. If pretty much all the lemons that have been tasted over the last hundred years were sour, it's more likely that the next lemon will be sour than, than that it won't be sour. So this is both true and strong. The premise is true and the argument itself is strong. So what does that mean about this argument? It is called a cogent argument. It's a perfectly successful inductive argument. It's a good example of a co cogent argument. It parallels, remember our Merlot example, which was a good example of a sound argument in deductive land. 
Okay, so but now we're going to wonder what the hell is a unsuccessful inductive argument called? We know what an unsuccessful in general, what an unsuccessful deductive argument is called. It's called a what? It's called an unsound argument. Let's go back to our chart to see this parallel. An unsuccessful deductive argument is called an unsound argument. And what is an unsound argument? It's an argument about which one of the following three facts is the case. It's either invalid, it has at least one false premise, or both. Now, in parallel, how would we define an uncogent argument? It's blank, it has at least one false premise, or both. What obviously are we going to fill in the blank with? We're going to fill it in with the parallel concept to the deductive term, invalid. And what is that parallel concept? I'll write it in. It's weak. So an uncogent argument, an unsuccessful inductive argument, is an argument about which one of the following three things is the case. It's weak in the technical sense of the term, meaning that the conclusion is not more likely to be true than not true, even if the premises are true. It has at least one false premise, or both. All right, so let's continue where we were after we filled in that chart. Where were we? Um, and as I said here, and I'll repeat it one more time since I have it written out, an uncogent argument is an argument about which one of the following three things is true. One, two, or three. It's weak, it has at least one false premise, or it's weak and it has, uh, it's both weak and it has one false premise, at least. So how are we going to classify this following argument, then, in terms of uh, these three options? Because this is obviously an uncogent argument. It's not a successful probabilistic or, in, or inductive argument. So how, then, are we going to classify it? In which category does it fall into? One, two, or three? I'll read it out. One, most women are over eight feet tall. That's premise one. Premise two, Beyonce is a woman. Therefore, Beyonce is over eight feet tall. Let's, let's break it down into steps. First of all, is this a strong argument or a weak argument? This should be a no-brainer no at this point. Don't overthink it. It just is based on the very definition of strong and weak. Obviously, this is a very strong argument. It's a strong argument. It's an example of good inductive reasoning in the sense that it's strong. The conclusion is more likely to be true than not true on the assumption that the premises are true. In other words, if the premises are true, the conclusion is indeed probable, highly probable. But despite the fact that it's strong, it's not cogent. Why? Because at least one of the premises is false, particularly number one is false. And hopefully not premise 2 is false, um, but uh, I think premise, for all we know, premise 2 is true. But why this argument fails to be cogent, why it's uncogent, is that premise 1 is false. I think you guys are good with both the basic concepts of deductive logic, which we just reviewed today, and the parallel concepts of probabilistic logic, or as I call it, and as your textbook calls it, inductive logic. I think you're good. Maybe we'll review more or less a little bit in our review session some of those basic concepts. But like I said, I want to devote more so time to thinking about more sophisticated problems in our review session. So really, if you have any clarifications, uh, questions when it comes to the basic concepts of either of these sets of logic, deductive or inductive, then just email me. Now what I want to do is shift gears and start looking at, now that we have the basic concepts of inductive logic down, I want to consider four of the most common inductive argument forms. Remember we looked at five of the most common valid argument forms in deductive land? Now I want to go over four of the most common inductive argument forms. You've all encountered all four of these, by the way, and I bet that most of you have used all of them, and all of you have at used at least have used at least one of them. So to give you an outline for what I'm going to do for the rest of the class, in each case I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to describe the form of the argument. 
I'm going to give you its schematic variable form. I'm going to tell you what it looks like in variables, just like I did in with, with our deductive forms. I use P's and Q's and all that. And then second, I'm going to give you guys some observations. I'm going to make some observations concerning what makes for successful substitution instances of each of those forms. So in other words, I'm going to provide you, uh, I'm going to tell you what the form looks like, and then I'm going to give you tools for being able to figure out whether substitution instances of those forms are successful or not. Okay, that's what I'm doing in effect. All right, let's start out at the top of the list with argument by authority. Argument by authority has the following form. Premise one, R sincerely believes that P, therefore P. Now, in order to understand what this is even saying, you have to know two things. First, you have to know what the hell P stands for. P stands for a proposition, which in our terminology in this class, would we'll just call a statement. Sophisticated philosophers typically draw a distinction between the, the propos a proposition and a statement. The statements are true or false declarative marks on a board or spoken words, whereas the proposition is what is referred to by that declarative sentence. Um, but for, our, for all intents and purposes for our class, a proposition just means a statement, and a statement just means a proposition. That's fine. So you already know what a statement is. A statement is a true or false declarative sentence. So P simply stands for a true or false declarative sentence. Now R, what does R stand for? Well, we're dealing with argument by authority. What the hell do you think R stands for? R stands for the authority that's cited in the argument. Now I guess it's important to, I think you all have a sense of course of what an authority is on some subject matter, but let's get some sort of definition for what an authority is. What is an authority? in some area, like uh, in, in some field, like in physics, or in some domain, like in boxing, or something like that. What is an authority? How would you define an authority? An authority is, well, I would just say, if you asked me to do that and I was a student, I would just say it's an authority is an expert on some subject matter. In other words, an authority is, as I'm writing up in the text box right now, an authority is a reliable producer of true statements on some topic. An authority, in other words, is a source of reliable information on some topic. So if you're an authority on boxing, then you're able to offer um, informative advice and commentary on boxing. Joe Rogan, for example, is, you probably know who that is, he's an authority when it comes to mixed martial arts. He knows what's happening in those fighting events. He has names for all the different chokes and holds that are being used. Um, and so he, and, and, and he knows how, what makes for a successful fight, what strategies to use to get out of certain holds and all that. He's an authority in that area. Um... I'm an authority in philosophy, because that's my area of expertise. Uh, Stephen Hawking is an authority in physics, because that's his area of expertise. All right, so we have those basic concepts down. Notice, by the way, this should also seem obvious, that there's a direct correlation. There, let me put it this way. As the reliability of the authority cited goes up, so too does the strength of the substitution instance of argument by authority. The more reliable the authority cited, the stronger the argument by authority. That should be obvious. The, 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 the more reliable the cited authority, the stronger the argument is going to be. So your goal when you make an argument by authority, you want to cite the most reliable authority. Obviously, you want to cite the most reliable expert. Now, there is one exception to this here. Let's go to the next slide to see this. What about this substitution instance of argument by authority? God, well, I, by God, I mean we might have different we might have different definitions of God in mind, but at least by God, I mean an infallible being. 
what is an inf what is an infallible being? It's a being that can't make a mistake. That's always right. Okay. So what happens if I have this following substitution instance of argument by authority? One, an infallible being, God, sincerely believes that Beyonce will die tomorrow. Therefore, Beyonce will die tomorrow. Would you call this argument strong? You might be tempted to call this argument strong. However, it's, you would be wrong to call it strong. Now, you're going to say, well, Mike, didn't you just tell me that there's a direct proportionality, a direct correlation between the strength of the argument by authority and the reliability of the authority? Yes, I did say that, but there's one exception. There's a point at which the authority can become so reliable that the argument is no longer strong. As weird as that sounds, that's the case. That, that's what we have here in this case. Because notice, since, since God is an infallible being, if he sincerely believes that Beyonce is going to die tomorrow, if that's really the case, it must be the case that Beyonce will die tomorrow. So this is no longer a strong argument. Instead, it's, it's shifted from an, in, from an inductive argument to a deductive argument. It's a valid argument. It's logically impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. Well, in this case, if the premise is true. If God really does sincerely believe that Beyonce will die tomorrow, if we assume that's the case, it has to be that Beyonce will die tomorrow. It's not that it's very, very probable she will. It's that she must, which what this is, and, and thus, when the reliability of the authority goes so high as to reaching the pinnacle of infallibility, the argument by authority shifts from an inductive substitution instance to a deductive one, and in particular, a valid one. Hopefully you see that. Now, that just because this argument is valid doesn't mean it's sound. In order for it to be sound, I see I'm work, working in all types of review as we go here, so I don't have to waste my time on it in the next session. In order for an argument to be sound, it must not only be valid, but what? The premises have to be true. So the only way for this argument to be sound is if premise one was true. Now, if premise one was true, then there would be no way to avoid the conclusion, she will die tomorrow. That's the strength, by the way. That will, I don't want to confuse you by using that term. That's the impact of having a sound argument. If you ever have a sound argument for some claim, it must be the case that the claim is true. That's why that's the gold standard goal of one, of one who makes a deductive argument. Now, in this class, we're not even going to look at a lot of inductive arguments as it is. But if we ever see any inductive argument, it's almost never going to be of this sort um, if we uh, where I, I guess I should reword that if we're ever going to see an argument by authority it's almost never going to be uh, a sub it's, it's almost never going to be a deductive substitution instance like this one right here is most argument by authorities are going to be inductive or probabilistic in nature because the cited the, the authorities that are cited are typically humans or at least just fallible creatures like my dog or something my dog sincerely believes i'm about to feed him in 10 minutes you're never going to have well i mean there are some presidents actually that <laughs> they do consult i guess infallible authorities like god god says we should bomb the iraqis they have WMDs. Barring those situations, though, most substitution instances of argument by authority that you're ever going to confront in this class and in, your, and in your life at large will be inductive in nature. So the question then will be, is the substitution instance in question strong or weak? Now, how do you figure that out? Well, we're trying to figure out whether the cited authority is, um, uh, is a reliable authority. And we can kind of break that up into portions here. Look, look at it this way. There are three main ways for an argument by authority to fail to be strong. There are three main ways for an argument by authority to fail to be strong. By attending to these three ways, we're going to learn what it takes for an argument by authority to be strong. 
In particular, we're going to see what questions we need to ask any substitution instance of an argument by authority in order to figure out whether the, whether the son of a bitch is strong or not. Um, in other words, remember I said in each case of these four inductive argument forms, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to tell you what the form looks like, which I did already with argument by authority. And then I'm going to tell you what makes for successful substitution instances of that argument form. Right now, by way of going over the three main ways in which an argument by authority can fail to be strong, I'm going to tell you how to make successful substitution instances of argument by authority. Now, the first main way in which an argument by authority can fail to be strong is if the cited authority, R, is not really an authority. Now, some of these cases are easy to spot. Obviously, um, the drunk wino on the corner who has no education is not going to be an authority on the matter of whether I should have my son undergo open heart surgery. I'm not going to tell my doctors, hey, before we make this, this decision about whether I'm going to put my son under the knife so soon, I have to consult Willie the wino on the corner. Willie the wino is not a relevant authority in that case. Willie the wino is not really an authority in that area. He may be an authority on wines, but he's not an authority, or at least cheap wines, Boone's Farms he's drinking. But he's not going to be an authority, barring some weird facts that we don't know about, um, on the matter of open heart surgery. Now, other cases, however, are harder to spot. Let me give you an example. Remember before I mentioned Stephen Hawking as an authority in physics. I mentioned Stephen Hawking because you probably all know who that is. He's dead now, but only recently, and he's one of the most famous scientists that ever lived. Um, so how to do this? Well, look at it this way. You might think that Stephen Hawking is an authority on the question of what the value of science is um, for the culture at large. So imagine you're thinking about this question, what the hell is the value of science for the culture at large? You might think that Stephen Hawking is an, a good authority to consult on that particular question. Why would you think that? Well, as I said already, in case you didn't know, Stephen Hawking is a leading authority in the physics community. So who better to ask on what the value of science is for the culture at large than Stephen Hawking? However, you got to be careful. Questions concerning the value, questions concerning the worth or the value of physics or science in general are not themselves a physicist's question. Physicists, in their capacity as physicists, don't deal with questions of value. Philosophers, in their capacity as philosophers, deal with questions of value. The question of what the value of science is for the culture at large is not a physicist's question. It's a philosophical question. Hawking is not known as an authority in philosophy. In fact, unlike many other physicists that have lived, like, um, well, Einstein, uh, maybe even Carl Sagan, cosmologist he would be, or astro, he's the astrophysicist, I guess, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, maybe not Neil deGrasse Tyson, actually, Heisenberg will, will do that. Those people were both, they, they were at the same time physicists and reputed to some degree um, in the philosophical community. They had some clout in the philosophical community. People like Hawking are not considered to be an authority on, in philosophy. So the point is, you, some cases are hard to tell. There are some cases you might think that R, the cited authority, is really an authority, but it turns out that they're not really an authority. And the Stephen Hawking case is one of them. To summarize it again, you may think that Stephen Hawking is a relevant authority when it comes to the question of what the value of science is for the culture at large, but he's not really a relevant authority on that question because that question is a philosopher's question and, and Hawking is not an expert in philosophy. Done. So, um, I 
I, let me just go on to the next way in which an argument by authority can fail to be strong. <clears throat> Another way in which an argument by authority can fail to be strong is if that argument ignores conflicting reports. More particularly, and as I say on the slide here, another way for an argument by authority to fail to be strong is if that argument ignores reports that P is false by authorities that are at least as reliable as R, the cited authority. Um, how to illustrate this? Um, maybe I'll do this in, maybe I'll do this in the chat box. Let's turn to the chat box. Let's say, here's a stupid example. I was having you write it, but, but it'll illustrate the point. Let's say you're writing a paper for me, right, for some reason, and you're trying to prove to me the following, that Aquinas, a philosopher, you don't know, need to know who this is, but Thomas Aquinas, a medieval Christian philosopher, one of the most famous philosophers, that Aquinas was born in 1225, AD. Let's suppose you're trying to prove that to me. And in order to support that, you cite R1, an authority in the history of philosophy. Write that out. Boom. And R1 says, and by says, I mean sincerely believes. R1 says that Aquinas was born 1225 A.D. Okay. okay. Now, if you gave me that argument, since R1 is a relevant authority, if, you know, R1's a historian in philosophy, so they're an expert on this matter, if R1 says that Aquinas was born in 1225 AD, it looks like then you have thereby a strong argument. If you wrote one, premise one, R1 sincerely believes that Thomas Aquinas was born 1225 AD, therefore Thomas Aquinas was born 1225 AD, it looks like that's a strong argument. However, let's imagine that unbeknownst to the argument or for all the argument tells us, there's this other authority out there R2, who assume is at least as reliable as R1, and also that R2 says that Aquinas was born 1224 AD, not 1225. Now, if your argument did not mention this other authority, if your argument, in other words, ignored the report that, in effect, P, the claim that Aquinas was born in 1225, is false by an authority that is, like R2, at least as reliable as the cited authority, R1, then your argument is not strong. In a vacuum, if there was no other conflicting report, your argument would have been strong because R1 is a relevant authority. However, if your argument ignores the report from R2, namely that P is false, namely, namely, that uh, Aquinas was born in 1224, uh, that means that your original argument is weak. Okay, so that should be obvious with that example, but even without the example, it's obvious. Another way in which an argument by authority can fail to be strong is if that argument ignores reports to the contrary. Reports to the contrary by authorities that are at least as reliable as are the cited authority. Now, another, another way in which an argument by authority can fail to be strong is if the argument misrepresents the authority, or as I say on the slide, misquotes or misinterprets the authority. Let me write up in the, in the text box, because I have a room to do so, um, an argument to make this point clear. Okay, again, another way in which an argument by authority can fail to be strong is if the argument misinterprets that authority. Here's a case of that right now. And I, I won't write it in premise form like one and two, but it should be obvious how everything looks. 
Okay, here's an argument by authority. The, the eminent biologist Stephen Jay Gould admits that evolution by natural selection is just the theory. Therefore, evolution by natural selection is just the theory. That is an unsupported hunch. Now, what went wrong with this argument? Why is it a weak argument? You might not know who Stephen Jay Gould is, but Stephen Jay Gould is indeed a biologist. And obviously, if an expert biologist, which Stephen Jay Gould is or was, he's dead now, uh, says that evolution by natural selection is just the theory, then that means evolution by natural selection is indeed just the theory. So why, though, is this argument weak, given the facts that you know about it? It should be pretty obvious why it's weak, because the words of Stephen Jay Gould have been twisted around. Yes, Stephen Jay Gould really does admit that evolution by natural selection is just a theory, but a theory in science or in any academic discipline doesn't mean an unsupported hunch. A theory, the word theory does not mean unsupported hunch in science or in any academic field. In fact, the evolution by natural selection is a well-supported, one of the most well-supported theories that there is. It's the gold standard of supported theories. It's not an unsupported hunch. So this argument has been made weak by the twisting of Stephen Jay Gould's words. Now, the twisting of somebody's words doesn't always happen consciously. In matter, in matter of fact, I took this argument from a discussion board, a, a Christian discussion board. Well, actually, I think it was on a YouTube channel. Um, where a, a, a Christian YouTube commenter, commenter made exactly this argument. Now, I don't think that Christian YouTube commenter um, was consciously twisting Stephen Jay Gould's words around. That would be pretty, well, for lack of a better term, demonic, to just purposely twist somebody else's words around to fit your agenda. Because obviously the Christian had an agenda. Uh, they, well, in this case, at least this Christian had an agenda because that, that Christian, the one in question, was um, thinking of evolution, evolution by natural selection as something incompatible with God existing. Now, not all people believe that that's the case, um, but many times that's how, at least in America, the two sides are often pitted. They're often pitted against one another, such that if you believe in evolution, you can't be Christian. And if you're Christian, you can't believe in evolution, which is silly by itself, but that's how it's often um, shaped. So I don't think that this person in the in the commenting box was purposely twisting Stephen Jay Gould's words. But what was likely the case is that it was done unconsciously. Probably what was the case, and I'm kind of hedging here, even though this is, I would bet my life on it. This person was so hijacked by an ideology, in this case Christianity, that they knew not what they were doing. They were saying to everybody in, that was reading the chat, Something like, hey, look, even Stephen Jay Gould, this expert uh, biologist, even he admits, even he admits that evolution by natural selection is just a theory, an unsupported hunch. This person is so hijacked by their ideology that they didn't even realize that they, that everybody understands that a theory is not just an unsupported hunch. So you have, the point is you have to be careful. It's not always that you're misquoting or misinterpreting the authority on purpose. Sometimes you're doing it inadvertently because you're hijacked in this case, for example, like in this case, by an ideology. So be careful. Um, now, in light of these three ways in which an argument by authority can fail to be strong, we can develop a little toolkit for assessing arguments by authority. I'm going to develop a toolkit for all of the four basic, most popular inductive argument forms. I'm going to give you a toolkit, in other words, for evaluating substitution instances of each of those forms. And the toolkit is always going to come in the form of questions to ask. So anytime you're confronted, in this case, by an argument by authority, you're going to ask three corresponding corresponding to the, this stuff here that I just did, three corresponding questions of it. The first question you're going to ask is, corresponding to number one up here, is the cited authority, is R, the, one, the, the authority, the expert that's cited, really an authority that, on the topic? 
is our a relevant authority on that topic? That's the first question you're going to ask any substitution instance of argument by authority in order to figure out whether it's strong or weak. The second question you're going to ask, which corresponds with number two, is are there other authorities that say that P is false? Are there, in other words, conflicting reports? And if there are conflicting reports, are the people who are conflicting with the cited authority, are they more or less equally reliable as the cited authority? Now, question three has to do with what we just said, the corresponding number three up here. Has the authority been correctly interpreted? So obviously, using number question number three, we would say, because Stephen Jay Gould wasn't correctly interpreted, because he was misquoted, uh, misrepresented, misinterpreted, the argument is thereby weak. Now, to go back to this argument, if we would have crossed out an unsupported hunch, by the way, what, what would this have been, this argument? It would have been strong. You see, that, that just that parenthetical remark made all the difference. Okay, so that's our toolkit for assessing arguments by authority. We're going to develop similar toolkits for each of the other inductive argument forms. All right, let's go on to the next one. Argument by analogy. You've all seen this one, too, before. You probably used it yourself. Arguments by analogy have the following form. A is similar to B, or another way to put it is A resembles B, or A and B are alike. I'll just use this language of similarity. A is similar to B, too. B has a certain property. We'll call it Fness. B has a certain property, Fness. So likely A has that property too. A has property Fness. That's how argument by analogy works. Argument by analogy says two things are similar, and since one has a certain property, uh, the other has that property. Likely. Obviously, evaluating an argument by analogy involves figuring out whether A's similarity to B does in fact provide support for the conclusion that A has property Fness as well. Um, so how do we, by the way, just so you know, Fness, if that's weird to you, it's just, it's, 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 it's a variable for a property. Like if I said hoarseness or trilaterality or brownness or redness, okay, it's just a placeholder for a property. So I'll repeat what I just said. Evaluating an argument by a, analogy, it, it, it amounts to figuring out whether A's similarity to B provides support for the conclusion that A has the property that B has. Now, how do we figure this out? We're going to get answers to the following three questions. I'm going to give you the toolkit for assessing argument by analogy right off the bat. The first question we're going to ask any substitution instance of argument by analogy is, first, what are the relevant similarities between A and B? What are the relevant similarities between A and B? Now, I guess I should define for you guys what it means to say that similarities between A and B are relevant. Similarities between A and B are relevant if those similarities increase the probability or increase the likelihood that A has property Fness. I'll say that again, and I'll write it up here just so we have it on the board. Similarities between A and B are relevant if those similarities increase the likelihood that A has property Fness. See, I just wrote it up here. Similarities between A and B are relevant if they increase the likelihood that A has property Fness. Now, the second question you're going to ask is, of course, what are the relevant dissimilarities? Now, dissimilarities, not similarities, but dissimilarities between A and B are relevant if they what? Decrease the likelihood that A has property Fness. So I won't write that up because it's obvious because it's just the opposite. So what are the relevant dissimilarities? That's the second question we have to ask. And dissimilarities between A and B are relevant if those similarities decrease the likelihood between, uh, well, well, decrease the likelihood that A has the same property that B has, Fness in this case. And then the last question, of course, is are there things, beside A, of course, 
that are relevantly similar to B, and we figured out the relevant similarity up here at question one, are there things other than A that are relevantly similar to B and yet do not have Fness? In other words, question three is, can you think of any things that have the relevant similarity, the, the, the similarity that's relevant to B, um, and yet do not have the property that B has, Fness? Are there any things that are relevantly similar to B and yet do not have Fness? Now, the more and more you can think of, the more things that are relevantly similar to B and that don't have the property Fness that you can think of, the worse it is for the argument. In other words, to the extent that there are such things that are relevantly similar to B and yet fail to have Fness, the analogy breaks down, which is not good for the argument. That weakens the argument. On the other hand, to the extent that there are not such things, then the analogy holds up, which strengthens the argument. Let's look at a substitution instance of argument by analogy and use our tools here to assess the son of a bitch. I'm going to use an easy example just so we can get practice using our toolkit. Premise one, for A, let's put in parrots, and for B, let's put in women. And then for premise two, for Fness, let's put in the ability to think rationally. That's a property, the ability to think rationally. Okay, so premise one is parrots are similar to women. Premise two, women can think rationally. Therefore, parrots probably can think rationally. All right, so let's evaluate the argument by asking our three questions of it. Let's see, in other words, if this is a strong substitution instance of argument by analogy. Now you might already have an intuition about whether it is strong or whether it is weak. However, what's useful about these questions is that it helps us articulate our view. You may have a gut instinct that say it's uh, it's a weak argument, right? Like you may say, oh, that's a weak argument. And, but imagine somebody who somebody was seriously giving you this argument. Maybe you had a pothead friend, and they're like, "Yo, man, I think parrots, you know, probably can think rationally because you know they're, they're similar to women, man. You know, women can think rationally, and uh, so probably parrots can think rationally too." If you said to him, if your instinct was like, "Yo, man, that's a weak argument," obviously you want to try to convince that person. You can convince them by expressing why you think it's weak in terms of these three questions. Okay. So let's do so. Question one. First of all, what are indeed the relevant similarities between parrots and women? How are parrots similar to women? Remember, by the way, as I said up here, similarities between, well, in this case, parrots and women are relevant in this case if those similarities increase the likelihood of, parents, of parrots being able to think rationally. Now, I, so I don't want you to say, you know, both are in, you have parrots and women, you have, uh, both parrots and women are in Africa. You, you, there, there's parrots and women that are in Africa. That's a similarity that they have. Or both parrots and women are alive. That's a similarity that they have, but it's not obviously a relevant similarity without further argumentation. Because without further argumentation, that similarity doesn't increase the likelihood that parrots have the property in question, namely the ability to think rationally. So what is an obvious relevant similarity? Well, it's the reason I picked this example. Parrots have the ability to talk. Parrots talk. I'll write that. Parrots talk. That's the relevant similarity. Okay. Parrots talk, relevant similarity, bang. There's other relevant similarities too. Maybe they both have brains. I say that's a relevant similarity because it looks like it takes a brain in order to think rationally, although maybe the AI people will disagree with that, so I don't want to use that as an example. The main relevant similarity is that both parrots and women talk. Okay, I should have just said both parrots and women talk, not just parrots talk, but you got you got the point. Um, and why is talking a relevant similarity? Well, it's primarily in linguistic behavior that the capacity for rational thought is exhibited. 
So the fact that uh, parrots can talk it at least increases the likelihood that they have the ability to think rationally. Since, again, talking is um, one of the primary ways that the capacity for rational thought is expressed. Okay. Now, number two, what are the relevant dissimilarities between A and B? There are many that we can bring up. Don't say that one has feathers and the other doesn't. That's a dissimilarity, but it's not, without further argumentation at least, an obvious relevant dissimilarity. Remember, a relevant dissimilarity between parrots and women in this case would be a dissimilarity that decreases the likelihood that parrots have the ability to think rationally. What would be a relevant dissimilarity? I'll put it in my in my text box here. Parrots merely copy. Women do not merely copy in their speech. Or, or something like that. Okay. Rel relevant dissimilarity between parrots and women is that women can spontaneously form speech. They can go coffee can aardvark. They don't have to be trained to say, say coffee can right now. They can come up with um, new sentences that go on and on and can do all types of unique things. Parrots, when they talk, are merely mimicking. Polly want a cracker? They've been taught that by their owner or whoever they were around. Now, why is the fact that parrots merely copy, whereas women do not merely copy, a relevant dissimilarity? Mimicking is not a reliable indicator of rational thought. Parrots are merely mimicking what they hear, and mimicry is not a reliable indicator of rational thought. So it decreases the likelihood that parrots have the ability to think rationally. All right. Um, well, uh... Now let's go to question number three. Are there any things, any creatures, any beings that you can think of besides um, parrots that are relevantly similar to B, namely that they can talk? That's the relevant similarity here. They can talk um, and yet do not have the ability to think rationally. Can you think of anything? The more you can think of, the worse it is for the argument. Um, I have some, let's say, well, Siri, is that, hopefully this is how you spell it, S-I-R-I. -I. Siri, that talks, um, but it doesn't have the ability to think rationally. The teddy bear, the infant, well, the, 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 yeah, the infant can talk, da da. Uh, the deranged Willy the Wino, derang <laughs> deranged Willy the Wino, the one that I mentioned before. Um, anything else? Yeah, those, those are good. It looks like the analogy breaks down all over the place. Siri talks, teddy bears talk, you know, the ones that you squeeze their belly or whatever. I love you. Infants talk, da-da, deranged Willie the Wino talks. Um, in his moment of being deranged, I mean, he has the ability to think rationally outside of it, but imagine a person by deranged, I mean, like totally in a psychotic break. In the moment of their psychosis, um, they don't have the ability to think rationally, but they sure are talking. Okay, so the analogy breaks down all over the place. In light of our answers to the three questions, what are you going to say about this argument? Do you think it's strong, or do you think it's weak? Oh, by the way, it looks like I had a good space. I didn't even know that I did, but it looks like I had a good space to add our answers in down here. But I didn't. It's okay. Um, what are we going to say? Is this argument strong? Or weak. It looks like the argument street. It looks like the argument's weak. Yes, there is a relevant similarity that does increase the likelihood that parrots have the ability to think rationally, particularly they can talk. But aside from that, parrots merely copy when they talk. They're merely mimicking, which is not a reliable indicator of rational thought. Um, so that severely decreases the likelihood that parrots can think rationally. Also, the analogy that's drawn, which is the full strength of this argument, is done in terms of analogy, it breaks down all over the place. Many things can talk, but don't have the ability to think rationally. So in the end, this son of a bitch is weak.
again, you might have already had an instinct that that was the case, but now you can explain explain why, which is so important in philosophy, you can explain why what you think is the case is the case in a convincing way. Maybe your pothead friend would be like, oh yeah, man, I guess, I guess, I guess you're right. That is true. That is true. The analogy breaks down all over the place. And mimicry is not a reliable indicator of rational thought. All right. Now let's go on to argument by enumeration. Okay, that's our that's our third. Yeah, that's our third inductive argument form. Here's how it looks on the top of your slide. Blank percent of a sample of population A are B. Therefore, blank percent of population A are in fact B. Premise 1 again. Blank percent of a sample of population A or B, therefore blank percent of the actual population A or B. Now, in order to understand what argument by enumeration is saying in this in this schematic form here, you have to know, I guess, two main things. First of all, you have to know that blanks can be filled by numbers from 0 to 100 inclusively. And, and you, I guess you need to know what the hell this is, a sample of a population. A sample of a population is not just a small piece of a population. Usually when we say, can I sample this, it means take a little small piece. But a sample technically can be the whole piece. <laughs> so um, I know usually a sample is a mere portion of the whole and not the whole. But even if you took the whole, that would still be a sample. So we have to be rigorous in our definition of a sample a, 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 of a population. A sample of a population is simply the group of observed members of that population, whether some small piece, as it typically is, or the whole thing. All right. So um, I guess this should be clear just given those two things that I just said. But in order for an argument by enumeration, in order for a substitution instance of this form right here to be strong, the sample has got to be good. So what makes an argument by enumeration strong is that the sample has to be good. And I don't just mean that term loosely, I mean it technically. What is a good sample? A good sample is a sample that's random. You probably knew that already. You probably knew all these things. You probably took a basic statistics. A good sample of a population is a sample that's random. In other words, it's unbiased. It's big enough, Michael Scott, of appropriate size, in other words and undistorted. Typically, if it's distorted, it's distorted by psychological factors. So yeah, that's what makes a good sample. And if you have a good sample, um, then uh, that that's that's what's going to make your argument strong. Um, if, if, you, if it says 80% of a sample of population A or B, therefore 80% of population A are B, that's going to be a strong argument if it's the case that your sample was good. But I want to make sure that you guys understand the key elements of a good sample. I want to define each of these three for you or give you examples of these things or whatever, just so we drive the point home and I don't leave what a good sample is vague. Let's start off with randomness here. What's a random sample? A random sample is, as I already said, it's an unbiased sample, a sample that's not biased. To put it more informatively, uh, reading off the slide, a random sample is a sample in which each member of the population has equal chance of being selected for observation. Now, why is random sampling important? Well, if your sampling is not random, if it's biased, you run the risk of not getting an accurate picture of the population at large. Let me actually give you a famous case to show that this is indeed the case. You probably at least if at least maybe two to five percent of you probably heard this example before in another class, whether in a sociology class, an economics class, a, a statistics class. It's a famous example. But it's, this example is going to make clear why having a random sample is crucial to having uh, uh, an accurate picture of the society, or the population in this case, at large. Here's the example. In 1936, Literary Digest conducted a poll 
to figure out who would win the next presidential election. Okay, so this is 1936. There was a presidential election coming up. It was between, I'll write in the text box right up here at the top, it was between Alf Landon uh, versus, oh, right, versus Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. 1936 Literary Digest, a key magazine, conducted a poll to, to see who would win, probably, the next presidential election, either Alf Landon or FDR. Literary Digest sent out, I think it was up to maybe 15 million questionnaires, 10 to 15 million questionnaires two mil to the American people. Two million of those questionnaires were returned, filled in, which is, by the way, uh, big enough. It's appropriate size. So we're no problem with size matters. Um, no problem with sample size. But notice this, based on this, the surveys that were returned, the Literary Digest predicted that Landon would win the next presidential election. And in fact, win by a landslide. In reality, though, who ended up winning the election? FDR. So what went wrong? By the way, FDR, I think, won by a landslide. So Alf Landon was predicted to win by a landslide. FDR actually won by a landslide. So what went so horribly wrong? Well, the sampling was biased. The, the sampling um, was not random. How was it not random? Do you, you, if you know this story, you probably know how it wasn't random. Where did Literary Digest just get the names to send the questionnaires to? They didn't. They tried to be bi unbiased. They tried to be random. They didn't just get send the questionnaires out to their subscribers because. They knew that their, their subscribers had a certain leaning politically. They wanted their prediction to be correct. They didn't want it to be skewed in how they wanted it or whatever, something like that. They were trying to be random. They were trying to get an accurate picture of the society at large. So what they did is they tried to get names randomly. What they ended up doing is they picked, they, they took names for who to send the questionnaires to from I th you think it was automotive subscriptions, automotive registrations, and telephone subscriptions. So the names of those surveyed had been taken from telephone subscriptions and automotive and, and car registrations. So people with telephones and cars. Um, but why is this important? Well, notice when th this is taking place. This is taking place in 1936. What's going on in 1936? 1936 is the time of the Great Depression, where many people, many, many, many people weren't uh, wealthy enough to own cars or to have telephone subscriptions. So notice that because of how they got the names for who to send the questionnaires out to, the poorest members of the population had way less of a chance for being selected for the survey. The poorest members of the population had a less of a chance for being selected for the survey, and that's extremely relevant in this case, because Al Alf Landon was the Republican candidate, as I'm writing here, R, and FDR was the Democrat candidate. And why is that relevant? Which party is seen as having in their interest the interests of the poor? The Democratic candidate. So no wonder... Uh, that the Democratic candidate was slated to lose, according to the poll, when the poorest members of the population had less of a chance for being selected uh, for being surveyed. No wonder, since all it was mainly the rich people that were turning in these surveys, and since Alf Landon was the rich man's candidate as a Republican, no wonder Alf Landon was slated, according to this poll, to win by a landslide. So I just wanted to show you this as a good example, a famous historical example, why it's important to have your sample be um, un unbiased, random. Now, the size issue should be obvious. Um, you want your sample to be big enough. An appropriate size sample is a sample big enough to give a representative view of the population at large. Um, sample size uh, 
well, let me put it this way. Let's imagine a scenario. Here, I'll draw a like, stupid little picture. Imagine we have a barrel of marbles, right? We have a barrel of marbles that they're either red or blue, but not both. Red or blue, but not both. By the way, what sense of or am I using there? If I say all of these marbles in here are either red or blue, but not both, am I using the or inclusively or exclusively? I'm using it exclusively. You see, I'm working in as much review as I can. Um, now, suppose we have a barrel of 10,000 marbles. So 10K. So that are 10,000 marbles that are either red or blue, but not both. Obviously, if we're trying to figure out approximately what percentage of marbles in that barrel are red and which percentage are, blur, uh, are blue, it would not be sufficient, even if our sampling is unbiased, even if it is random, um, to just sample, say, only two marbles. It wouldn't be a big enough sample if we just reached in one time, bang, and say I pulled out a blue marble, and then reached in another time and pulled out a blue marble, it would be illicit. It would be wrong for me to conclude that probably it's 100% blue in there. Probably. My sample size isn't big enough. Ec economists and statisticians have a good formula for telling you what would be the minimal number, uh, the, minimal, the minimal number of marbles you have to pick at random to get you a representative view of the uh, population at large, but it's definitely definitely not two. Two is not big enough. Okay, so you want your sample to be big enough. Lastly, you don't want your sample to be distorted. What is a distorted sample? A distorted sample is a sample where the relevant information observed is somehow altered in the process of trying to observe that information. Um, samples can especially be distorted by psychological factors. For example, Let's let's assume that I came into your class, right? Let's assume that I came into your class today and I said, let me conduct a quick little survey to see what's your favorite make of car. And I put up on the board several different makes and I said, and I went through the list. I said, take out a piece of paper and write which one is your favorite. Just real quick, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. And I went through the list and I said, Ford, I read it out, Ford, Toyota, Mitsubishi, you see how I had a grimace and a tone of disgust when I said Mitsubishi? That right there potentially tainted, tainted the data. In effect, I inadvertently or not inadvertently uh, distorted what I was trying, the information that I was trying to gather from all of you. We're all social creatures, and so being social creatures, being herd-like, you're prone to conform to what other people to believe. So even if you really like Mitsubishi, a part of you, if you're a good domesticated air, animal like we all are, when that person said Mitsubishi with a tone of disgust, you might have second-guessed yourself a bit about whether Mitsubishi is indeed your favorite car. Even if you compensated for that and said, "Well, f this," I know I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just go with what she says. Still, the data is being tainted by those very psychological factors. So you want to make sure that the sample is not distorted. All right, let's go now into our final inductive argument form. It's called argument by abduction. Oh, by the way, before we go into argument by abduction, notice that we have a toolkit for assessing arguments by enumeration, and that toolkit is simply a matter of figuring out whether the sample is good enough. Um, and so the first question we're going to ask, obviously, is the sample random as opposed to bias? Is the sample of appropriate size? Is it good, is it good enough in size? And three, are there any psychological factors or any other factors distorting the data of the sample? All right. Um, let's go now into our final uh, argument form. It's called argument by abduction. Now, argument by abductions are also known, and they might be known as this in your textbook, actually, as arguments to the best explanation. They have the following form. Premise 1, P, and P stands for some proposition, again, of statement, as we went over before. 
premise 2, the best explanation for P is A, therefore A. Very simple. You probably all used this or at least seen this argument form before. Now, evaluating an argument by abduction involves, obviously, figuring out whether A is indeed the best explanation for P. That's the key factor we're trying to figure out here. We're trying to figure out whether premise 2 is true. Now, notice the, the, the fact that I say that. Notice that argument by abduction is different from the other three argument forms for that reason. In the other three argument forms, I gave you guys a toolkit for trying to figure out whether the Sub, whether substitution instances of that argument form were strong or weak. Notice that I'm not going to give you, there would be no reason for me to give you a, a toolkit for argument by abduction that's going to help you figure out whether the argument is strong or weak, because every substitution instance of argument by abduction has to be strong. All of them have to be strong. Every substitution instance of argument by abduction is strong, no matter what is plugged in. Our toolkit that I'm going to give you is meant to figure out whether premise 2 is true or not. So you see the difference? In the other ones, I was giving you a toolkit not to figure out whether some premise was true or not, but just to see if the argument was strong or not. In this case, we shift gears a little bit. I'm trying to give you tools to figure out whether premise 2 is true or not not whether the argument is strong or weak. I'm not trying to give you tools to figure out whether this argument is strong or weak because every substitution instance of argument by abduction is strong. And you can test that for yourself. Now, so how do we figure out whether premise two is true? That's the key question. How do we figure out whether A is indeed the best explanation for P? When judging whether a given explanation is better than others, there are, there are many factors we should consider, but here are the three most important factors that we should consider. First of all is explanatory efficacy. What do I mean by explanatory efficacy? Well, I mean two things, really. Explanatory scope and explanatory satisfaction, but I'll put it all together in one. The principle of explanatory efficacy, we can just call that it that. It's a principle. It says that all other things being equal, explanation A is better than some other explanation, call it B, if A accounts for more aspects of what occurred than B does, that's the scope part of it, and opens up less, or at least less difficult to solve, mysteries than B does. That's satisfaction. Okay, so the principle of explanatory efficacy says that all other things being equal, explanation A is better than explanation B, that w which is some other explanation, if A accounts for more elements of what occurred than B does, and also opens up less, or at least less difficult to solve, mystery than B does. The second principle that we're going to uh, appeal to in order to figure out whether premise 2 is true is called Occam's razor, or as I put on the slide here, the principle of parsimony. The principle of parsimony says that all other things being equal, explanation A is better than explanation B if A is simpler than B. The simplest explanation is the better explanation, all things being equal. That's what Occam's razor says, the principle of parsimony. Lastly, we're going to appeal to what is known as the principle of conservatism in order to figure out whether A is indeed the, be the best explanation for P in our schematic argument form. The principle of conservatism says that all other things being equal, A is better than B if A is less radical than B. In other words, if A is more conservative than B. See, philosophers like scientists are conservative people. All things being equal, if you have two theories, everything else about them is equal. They have the same explanatory eff efficacy, um, and they're as parsimonious as, as one another. You're going to go with the one that's more conservative, the one, in other words, that better fits with the rest of what we already believe. So obviously, from these three 
principles by which we judge whether premise 2 is true, we're going to derive our toolkit from that. Here's our toolkit for assessing argument by abduction. The first question you're going to ask every substitution instance of argument by abduction is, does A account for what occurred more thoroughly than B does, and in a way that does not open up more and or more difficult to solve mysteries than B does? Does A account for what occurred more thoroughly than B does, and in a way that does not open up more, or at least doesn't open up more difficult to solve, mysteries than B does? The second question you're going to ask is explanation A simpler than all the other explanations, like B. Question three is, does explanation A fit in with our other beliefs better than some other explanation, like B? Let's take an example to just use for practice. Let, let's you let's assess it according to our our three questions. Okay. Premise one. The lights frequently flicker in my house. That's P. Premise two. The best explanation for the flickering in my house that's been chronic over a month, say, is that the house is haunted. Therefore, the house is haunted. Everybody sees that this is a substitution instance of argument by abduction. The question is. First of all, is this argument strong? Yes, it is strong. Remember, I said every substitution instance of an argument by abduction is strong. The question is, with, and, and this is what our toolkit is going to help us answer, is whether premise two is true. In other words, is the fact that the house is haunted the best explanation for all the flickering that's going on? That's the question. Now, we use those three questions to figure that out. The first question we're going to ask is, uh, does, does the house being haunted account for what occurred more thoroughly than some other explanation? And does it, uh, does it open up more mysteries that are difficult to solve than some other explanation? So let's, let's just go down the line and actually do it in terms of that. So while it does seem true that the house being haunted uh, accounts for what occurred quite thoroughly, like, you know, everything that's happening, you can account for it because uh, by saying the house is haunted. The explanatory efficacy of that explanation is still not the best compared to other explanations, like, say, that there's an electricity problem, because unlike other explanations, like there's a le an electricity problem, the explanation that the house is haunted opens up new and more difficult to solve mysteries. Like for example, um, like saying that the house is haunted opens up mysteries like, well, why the hell is the house haunted in the first place? Why, and also why is, is the haunting manifesting in terms of flickering lights as opposed to books being thrown across the room or um, molestation of the children or something like that? These mysteries are hard to solve. Saying that the house has an electrical problem, on the other hand, um, opens up new mysteries. Yes, of course it does. Like, why is there an electrical problem? Uh, but those new mysteries are easier to solve. There's an electrical problem because, for example, there's a rodent infestation or something like that. So I think in terms of question one, and namely in terms of explanatory efficacy, I don't think that the house is haunted is the best explanation. There's a better one, namely that there's an electrical problem. So in terms of explanatory efficacy, I think the house is haunted one fails. So premise two looks like it's false from that perspective. Now what about in terms of, what's our next one, uh, parsimony? Is the house being haunted a simpler explanation than other explanations? Well, no, uh, the electrical problem one is simpler. Yes, electrical problems are complex, but they're not as complex as supposing that the house is haunted, because when we suppose that the house is haunted, we have to we have to add a whole nother layer of reality. We have to add a whole nother stratum of reality, a supernatural stratum, to account for what's going on in the natural world. That complicates reality. That multiplies entities beyond necessity. We don't need to refer to another supernatural realm in order to account for the natural happenings here. But the house is haunted explanation posits a whole nother realm in order to account for the natural happenings here. In that case, it's not the simplest. So from the perspective of parsimony, it looks like uh, there's a better explanation.
there's an electrical problem. Now, lastly, we have conservatism. That there's an electrical problem is also the more conservative explanation. It's more conservative because it correlates better with the breast of our beliefs, at least as college-educated people. We believe that problems with things working correctly have a natural explanation. We believe, in particular, that when lights in the home aren't working properly, there's some sort of electrical issue. Notice, though, I keep on saying we, or the college-educated. Notice that what counts as more conservative, obviously, is going to be relative to an audience. So from our perspective, The people I'm imagining who, who are listening to this, um, I would imagine you guys would find it the, the explanation that the house is haunted is more radical than the explanation that there's an electrical problem. Um, I would assume that you guys all think, in other words, that the more conservative explanation is that there is an electrical problem. But imagine you're dealing with a backwoods superstitious people that's your audience, right? A backwoods superstitious people that regards doors closed by winds as doors closed by the ghost of their dead aunt, dead relatives and stuff. Maybe for those backwoods, backwards superstitious people, the more conservative explanation for the lights flickering in the house is that the house is haunted. So you do, I do, you do have to keep in mind that what counts as more conservative is relative to a certain audience. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume, for the people who are hearing this video, at least, the more conservative, the safer thing to say is that there's a, an electrical problem. Uh, so it looks like in all three regards, uh, the posited explanation, namely that the house is haunted, is um, not the best explanation. We have good reasons to think that premise two of our argument here is false. All right, I have two other arguments, but maybe you can do them at home. Now, the second one is about a lady named Ellie in the movie Contact. I would, I would say you should watch that movie. It brings up this really good I issue that you can think about. Um, I, I don't want to give you any spoiler alerts, but she, she, there's a debate about whether she makes contact with an alien civilization or whether what she experienced is just a hallucination, for example. And then you all know this, the story of Jesus coming back from the dead. There's another argument by abduction. Premise one, some people saw Jesus after his burial. Premise two, the best explanation for this experience, people's, you know, uh, for people experiencing this, is that he is a divinity that can come back from the dead. Therefore, he's a divinity that can come back from the dead. In fact, I would even improve this um, I might even reword this argument uh, as follows. Let me write it out and so to give you a better word, worded thing to think about. All right. I'm just going to change certain options here. I'll put it at the bottom, I guess. Let's see if I can get it in. If not, I'll put it in the chat box. Here's a better wording of the argument. Okay, premise one. Rumor has it, let's put it that way. Rumor has it that, um, I kind of did a typo here. Let me, okay. okay, rumor has it, this should be two. Rumor has it that people saw Jesus after he was killed and buried. That's premise one. Premise two is the best explanation for the rumor is that he's a divinity, a divinity that came back from the dead to save mankind. Therefore, he's a divinity that came back from the dead to save mankind or something like that. Okay. Now, that would probably be a better way to word, even though it's still sloppy. But it's a better way of word because it's in terms of rumor, so it's safer, uh, the argument. And I want you to think about that one, too. Um... You have to ask yourself, like, is it the simplest explanation? Is it the most conservative explanation that uh, he's a divinity that came back from the dead to save mankind? Is it an explanation that has the most explanatory efficacy? Maybe we can discuss this if we have time in our review session. I don't know, because um, I probably won't discuss this 
explicitly because not everybody's seen the movie, but everybody knows the story down here, the uh, the Jesus story. Anyway, I'm gonna end on that. That's our that's our that's the ending of our um, session on inductive logic. What I did is I went over the basic concepts of inductive logic, and then I gave you guys four of the most common argument forms of inductive logic, uh, ones that you've all seen. And then in each case, I told you what that form looks like and how to make successful substitution instances of each of them. In other words, I gave you a toolkit for assessing substitution instances of each of them. All right, I'll leave it at that. Have a good day, and I'll see you next time for our review session. Thank you, guys.